Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We're in our final week of looking at the four titles, the four descriptors of the coming Messiah and the significance of those, what they mean for us, how instantly practical these things are. Because sometimes we read the Bible and we read stuff and we're like, I have no idea what difference that makes to me. Uh, but the reality is, is that Scripture says that all of Scripture is useful for teaching us and training us for every good work that God has planned for us. And so these descriptors of the Messiah are immensely practical for uh, us understanding what Jesus came to do and who he is and what he actually offers us. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, would you stand as we read this singular verse? For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. You may be seated. Today we're talking about Jesus as our Prince of Peace. And uh, we, uh, the, the points this morning are not going to be extravagant. They're going to be pretty simple, but they are basic reminders of why Jesus is our Prince of Peace. It's, he's not just the Prince of Peace because the Holy Spirit is Baptist and likes alliterating things or anything like that. He is our Prince of Peace primarily because we all need peace. We all need peace. In fact, we just read it a little while ago from Luke chapter 2, that as the angels sang the, or declared the praise of the glory of God at the announcement at the birth of Christ, how did they sign off their praise? Peace and goodwill toward men. It's bound up in Jesus' mission. It's bound up in Christmas. This idea of peace. And it is something each and every one of us need. Well, why? Well, because life's hard. This world is full of trouble. Jesus promised us that. that he said, in this world, you will have trouble. And he says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's at the end of his public ministry. So at the beginning of his earthly, his incarnation, we see the angels declaring peace available to all mankind through Christ's birth. And at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we see Jesus telling his followers, you will have difficult days, but be at peace because you have me. The world is hard. Life comes with not just bumps, but gut-wrenching, heartbreaking moments. We all know this. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time explaining how life can beat us up sometimes. But that is not the primary reason that Jesus is our Prince of Peace and why we need peace. Yes, difficulty is universal because we live in a broken world, but we live in a broken world because we, by nature, are at war with God. You may think, well, that's strong language, Pastor, but that is precisely what Scripture says. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 19. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Christ, and through Him to reconcile everything to Himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So what does Paul say? Paul says that peace, it did not come through the manger. The manger was the beginning of God's effort to make peace with his enemies. But note, it is not God who started the war, but it is God who will end it. He will end it by making peace with you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, or he will make peace with you by utter defeat. That's what his second coming is about. That's what J.B. mentioned a while ago. That the second coming will usher in an end to sin. Once and for all. The, the, the manger, the incarnation of Christ, is the beginning of God's demonstration of His desire to make peace with those who have declared war against Him. 
Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. The clear testimony of Scripture is that every human being apart from Christ is under the wrath of God. Amen. James tells us that to be a friend of the world is to make yourself an enemy of God. This is the heart of the Christmas story. This is the heart of not just the Christmas story, but the Easter story, because those make up the gospel story. And the gospel story is this that God reaches out to those who say, I don't want peace with you, God. I want to be my own God. I want to do my own thing. I want to go my own separate way. I want to be the Lord of my existence. God reaches down to them, to us, and says, you can have peace. A peace that is bought by the shedding of blood, and that person's blood is Jesus Christ. And through His life, through His death, through His resurrection, you can be rescued from the fall. You can, you can be freed from the bonds of the curse of sin, and you can receive new life. You can receive peace. Because what is this peace? This peace is not the guarantee that you will never have another bad day in your life. It, it's, that's not it. That's not peace. Peace is more so about your character and your condition than it is about your circumstances. Peace is about you saying, no matter how difficult the seas get, no matter how rough life beats me up, I know that I am bigger than those circumstances because I am anchored in Christ. I know that nothing can destroy me because Jesus Christ is upholding me. I know that my life will not crumble because it is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, not on the shifting sands of anything else. We need peace. It is a universal reality. And this is why these phrases that we say at Christmas that can so often cause us to have a warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feeling are meant to do something bigger than warm our hearts. They are meant to lift our gaze above our life to fixate on Jesus Christ. Peace and goodwill towards men. God demonstrates His goodwill towards humanity even though we have done nothing since the garden but fight and kick and scream against Him. God is kind and gracious and patient in pursuing the rebels of which we are counted among them, or we were counted among them before we came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And this peace that Jesus offers... It's different than the peace we pursue a lot of times in life. I, I, I don't want to pull back the curtain too much on my family, but there are times where my house is chaos. All right? If you've ever had children in your home, you know this to be real. You, you, may, you love your children and they're sweet and adorable, but they are also at points these insane little tyrants. Right? You get it. They're children what children's do we were we were the same way when we were kids not, not me my brother and sister were i was good <laughs> but my and there are times when i just want peace and you know what peace is for me just quiet i just want quiet i, I don't i don't care what you're doing as long as i don't hear you doing it <laughs> and you also having been around tiny humans understand that when they're the quietest is also when they're probably doing the most damage. <laughs> it's when your premium is skyrocketing, right? And, but there are times where we exchange peace for quiet. We confuse the two. I, I, in ministry, there have been times where I'm like, oh, our church is not here previously, right? Our church is unified in that peace simply because there was quiet. 
And it turns out that it was quiet simply because everybody was reloading. Right? That wasn't peace. It was simply the still before or the, the calm before more bullets started flying. That's not the kind of peace that Jesus offers us. Jesus is not saying, listen, I'm going to give you about four seconds of quiet before all Hades breaks loose again. Now, see, this peace is greater than that. Jesus is the only peace that genuinely lasts. Jesus is the only peace that genuinely lasts because the peace is not separate from Jesus. Sometimes we, we, we pursue God because we want things from God. We see this in the book of Acts where people are trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the apostles or guys are trying to simply use the name of Jesus to cast out demons. And spoiler alert, it did not go well for them. One guy who tried to buy the power of the Spirit from Peter wound up blind. Another group of guys that tried to cast out a demon by the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, that demon-possessed guy beat them and they ran from the house bloodied and naked because they tried to use the power of God without actually experiencing the presence of God in their life. And it did not go well for them. The peace of God is the exact same. You only get it through Jesus. Because Jesus himself is this peace. It is not a commodity that we can purchase from God by our good behavior. It's not something that we can go and pick out of the heavenly vending machine because we've said the right prayer. It is Jesus. Jesus gives us a peace that lasts because it is Jesus himself that is our peace. He, is, he makes peace between us and Father, or our Father, through his cross. He is the peace. He doesn't just smooth out our exterior circumstances. He changes our inward identity. He doesn't just calm the storms of life. He calms our hearts. He doesn't just remove the punishment for our sin that we, de that we rightfully deserve. He also removes the shame of that sin that weighs us down in our conscience. Romans 8, 1 says that there's no more condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, which means you're not just forgiven, you are free of the shame of that rebellion. Because it's the shame of our sin that so often hangs on. Like, God, I know you forgive me, just help me to forgive myself. You ever pray that prayer? God, I know you're fine with me, but I don't like me. That's not peace. Jesus says, I take your shame and your guilt, and I throw it as far as the east is from the west. There is, Jesus is not condemning you, believer. You're forgiven. You're free. You don't have to walk back into the shadow of the prison cell. You're free. And in that freedom, there's peace. And that peace is only found in Christ. Jesus doesn't just declare a ceasefire between you and the Father. He doesn't just say, well, hold on, God's, God's not going to be, uh, you know, you started the war, but God's not going to fire any more shots at you. He doesn't say that. He invites you in as a son or a daughter. It, there is no more radical transformation. There is no greater miracle than those who have declared war against the Almighty being welcomed into his family forever as children of the God they once waged war against. All of the miracles you see in Scripture, the splitting of the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, the, uh, the healing of the blind and the sick in the Gospels, none of them come even remotely close to a sinner at war with God being forgiven of their sin and welcomed in as a part of God's family. And in that, there's peace. In that, there is a, a shift in identity that we no longer have to fight and scrape to generate our own kind of righteousness or our own kind of worth. It's all bound up in Jesus. You don't have to fight for God's approval. You don't have to climb a ladder of moral superiority just to get God to pay attention to you. God stepped towards you. God stepped towards us and says, anybody who will hear the truth of Jesus, who will repent of their sins and believe, will be welcomed in. That's peace. Peace is echoing Psalm 46.10 when God says, be still and know that I am God. 
You know what in Hebrew that phrase be still means? Stop fighting. Stop kicking and screaming. Stop trying so hard to be in control of everything. Just be at peace and let God be God. And you'll know a peace that you've not known before. Because Jesus came to end the war. And just as the wonderful, beautiful song that my beloved bride sang just a few minutes ago, that Jesus could have come. The Jesus we see in Revelation, splitting the skies and coming with a two-edged sword, flying out of His mouth, destroying the nations, judging the earth for its sin, that could have easily, that if it were God's plan, that could have easily been the first time we ever saw Jesus. That could have been God's plan. He, could, he didn't have to do the whole manger thing, the whole incarnation thing, the whole cross and resurrection thing. He could have skipped that entirely. But God is kind and generous and merciful. And He offers us, rather than the punishment we deserve, He offers us peace that transforms us. He offers us hope. He offers us life. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. So how do we know this peace? How can we know the peace that Jesus Christ offers to us? The first one is simply this. Turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. The idea here is surrender. Jesus actually uses the example of war when he's describing discipleship. When he's describing the cost of following him, he tells this parable of a, of a king who looks out and sees an enemy army approaching that outnumbers him like three to one. He says, now, what does the wise king do? What does the smart king do knowing he's outnumbered three or four to one? Does he send his army out to be obliterated by an enemy that is surely stronger than him? Or does he send out a flag of peace? Does he go out and say, listen, we surrender because we know if we put up a fight, we will not survive. So let's survive and have peace and I surrender. That's the picture of discipleship here. It is surrender. Turning to Christ is not simply adding Jesus to your life as some kind of charm on a charm bracelet or some kind of accoutrement you add to your spiritual wardrobe. It is you saying, you are the conquering king and I don't stand a chance against your judgment. Jesus, I need you. I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand that I am at war with you. But God, through the work of Jesus on the cross, through Him shedding His blood, I know that I'm forgiven. Please, accept me as your son or daughter. I believe in Christ. Turn to Christ. Surrender. Finally and fully and forever, turn to Christ. But I know many of you in this room have already done that. You belong to Jesus. But peace sometimes seems elusive. It seems like you grasp for it, and the, the tighter you grasp for it, the more it slips through your fingers. And to you, I want to say, rest in Christ. You belong to Him. The problem is that maybe you're still kicking and screaming and fighting and acting as though your peace depends upon you. I simply want to encourage you, rest in in Jesus. It's how Jesus says it in, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, of abiding in Him. John 1 tells us that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He made His abode with us. And at the end of the Gospel of John, we see Jesus saying, I came to live with you. Now you, if you want to do the things that God has asked you to do, if you want to be the people God has asked you to be, you must make your dwelling with me. But Philippians chapter 4, many of you know this verse. You can say these verses, but the reality is, is that these verses teach us how to rest in Christ. 
Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It goes on, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So how do we rest in Christ? We entrust ourselves to him. Paul says, rather than worrying about it, rather than being anxious, rather than you trying to orchestrate the circumstances of your own life and how all of the dots are going to connect and how all of the ends are going to meet, rather than that, you, you rest in who Jesus is. You go to Him and you make every request known to Him. Why? Because the Bible says you can cast all of your cares upon Him because He cares for you. You don't cast all of your cares upon Him because you've earned the right to have the ear of God. Jesus earned that right for you. He is your peace. He is your access to God the Father. And you are never going to wear Him out. God is never going to get tired of hearing your requests. He's never going to get tired of listening to your concerns or your worries. He's never going to get tired of you submitting yourself to the will of the Father again and again and again. He will not grow weary of you resting in Him. Before the service this morning, we were sitting in the back just listening. It's kind of a slower morning since we didn't have Sunday school, and which is kind of weird. I get a little bit antsy. Like I'm, I just, it's not the routine, and I'm a, I'm a creature of habit a lot of the time. And, and so I was sitting in the back with the kids, and our youngest, uh, Addie, just decided she wanted to cuddle. And she crawled up in my lap and just laid there like she did when she was like a, an infant. And I got to thinking, I'm like, man, you are bigger than you were the last time I remember doing this. <laughs> and she's just arms and legs and hair everywhere. And then she kind of situated and kind of laid her head on my shoulder. And she just sat there for like 20 minutes. And it was peaceful. And yeah, I got a little hot because, you know, she's a furnace. But it was peaceful. And as I thought, man, I, I don't ever want to get tired. I don't ever want to be too grouchy or too cranky for my kids not to be able to crawl up in my lap and just say, Dad, can I sit with you for a little bit? Now, there are times when they're doing it, I'm like, get off me. <laughs> but God is a better father than I am. God has no problem with you crawling up in his lap and just saying, Dad, can I sit with you for a while? Paul says we pray. That's how we rest in Christ. We pray. But we also guard our minds with the things that we're allowing our minds to dwell on. Whatever is true and right and honorable and lovely and worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Make sure you are forcing your mind and your heart and your soul to focus on the things that point yourself to Christ. The things that draw you away, the things that you're anxious about, they will lead you to destruction. They will cause a shipwreck in your soul. But if you fix your eyes on Christ, if you fix your eyes on the good things, no matter how bad the day is, Christ will be an anchor of hope for your soul. You will know peace. The promise here is when you pursue God through prayer, when you turn over the anxiety and the worry, and whenever you guard your heart and mind, what are the promises? Then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, or the God of peace, will be with you. If you want the peace of God, Scripture tells you how to do it. It's not through just repeating the name of Jesus over and over and over again, trying to conjure up some kind of spirit of peace. It requires us to be diligent and disciplined. It also requires us to simply say, God, I need you. God, 
has made his peace available to you. We've quoted the, we've prayed it a thousand times as believers. God, would the peace that surpasses all understanding be with them, especially during times of stress or loss. But Paul says there's something that has to come before that, that you as an individual have to pursue God in prayer. You have to crawl up in your father's lap to know that peace. You have to draw near to him. And the promise of Scripture, according to James chapter 4, is that when you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Turn to Christ. Rest in Christ. But also, stay near Christ. Stay near him. Don't just crawl up in his lap and then be like, all right, I got my nap. And then go off about your business. Stay near Him. Through consumption of the Word, devoting yourself to Scripture, devoting yourself to prayer, devoting yourself to biblical community, devoting yourself to obeying what God has revealed in your life that you should be doing, stay near Christ and you will find that peace becomes a regular rhythm in your life. You'll find that the more, you, the more you hang out with the Prince of Peace, the more at peace you'll be. And I would love to try to make this sound more complicated than it is. But praise be to God, it's just not as complicated as we make it. Turn to Christ. Rest in Him. And stay near to Him. And you will know the God of peace. You will have the freedom from the shame and guilt. You'll have life and you'll have it abundantly because that is exactly what Christmas is about. Christmas is about you being set free through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Not just free from eternal punishment, but free in this life from sin and condemnation and guilt and shame to walk in a manner of life that reflects the peace and goodness of God the Father. And that is the invitation this, this morning, this Christmas. If you don't know Christ, would you turn to the one who came to give himself up for you, to die for your sins so that you might have a new life? Would you surrender to him this morning by faith? Would you acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness? And that Jesus Christ's death on the cross purchased that forgiveness for you. And that Jesus Christ's resurrection promised you eternal life through faith in Him. Would you cry out to God this morning for forgiveness and salvation? And He will grant it. Not because you've said the right prayer, but because Jesus Christ has shed His blood for you. And maybe you are already a believer, but you're just struggling to know peace. Life seems to be in constant chaos for you and you seem to be caught up in it. Would you do the simple thing? Would you take your anxiety, your worry, your concern, would you make it known to God? And would you let Him provide the peace that you so desperately need? Would you rest in Christ this morning? Father, Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for intervention. Thank you for the incarnation. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to take on a human body, to live amongst us, to obey you perfectly, to at the right time die for our sins and rise from the grave, guaranteeing us eternal life, demonstrating that he is who he says he is, that he is the wonderful counselor, that he is the mighty God, that he is our eternal father, and that he is our prince of peace. Father, as we celebrate Christmas, Father, may we do more than observe a holiday. Father, may we celebrate Christ, the new life he offers. Father, in this morning, for those who have heard your truth, God, I pray that your spirit would work in their hearts and minds and that they would take a step of obedience. For those who need salvation, God, that they would cry out and they would receive it as your spirit works in their heart. Father, for those who have received salvation, but they're not walking in a manner that, that demonstrates the freedom and peace that you purchased for them. God, would you help them to rest in you? Would you show them how to simply curl up through prayer 
through petition and rest in you. And as we leave this place, would we all stay near you through devoting ourselves to the word and to prayer and to each other. We would go live lives that demonstrate that Jesus Christ is real, that Christmas is true, that Easter is true, and that salvation has been made available through the God of the universe. Father, have your way in us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.